Sorry about that. There you go. So with the curse of dimensionality, once you've at classification, clustering, and all these other analyses become really hard, right? You have more and more dimensions. You can't group people together. Because like I said, once you've reached, let's say, a thousand dimensions, each point is, is occupying its own unique place in space and may be quite far away from its next point. So once you try to cluster, so let's say you're doing a clustering algorithm and you've you know, shoehorned it into a K of three. Um, you're going to get points that are not similar to each other at all that are being forced to be neighbors uh, because you don't, because you've, you've told it you have to fit into three different groups. So what we want to do then is find the sweet spot in between what we have on the left and what we have on the right, right? So on one side we have an overly simplistic model, on the other side we have an overly specified model. So what we want to do ideally is have a lot more data, right? This is where big data is really helpful. Now we're in a world where you actually can have a thousand dimensions in a model, and given if you have enough data, um, it actually be viable to run a model and have enough data to have good results. But you know, you might not. So ideally, you'd have lots of features and lots of data. But if you don't have the luxury of you know tons and tons of data, what do you do? So what we're doing here is you know, reducing the dimensions without losing too much information by only pulling out the parts of each feature that, that's giving me information. So in feature extraction, for example, we would say drop one of the variables, right? So let's say we had cigarettes per day in height, we had our scatter plot, we dropped one, and now everything's sort of squished on that y-axis. But that's not really helpful in our case, right? Because we lost a lot of information there. There was some, oops, sorry. There was some variance that we saw in this that we're missing. We're no longer seeing that upward slope. Everything just seems to be on this straight line. There seems to be sort of two-ish clusters, but it's, it's not clear anymore. So why do we need dimensionality reduction? One, to better perform analyses, right? If I'm trying to cluster, if I'm trying to classify, we need to be able to group objects together. If we, we can't group if everything is living in its own plane, living in its own cloud or universe. But we also don't want to sacrifice the information we get from our features. It also helps to visualize our data. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to be able to communicate your findings, right? We can all do really great analyses if we can't impart what we found to a broader audience, especially if you are a practicing data scientist, often the people you will report these things to are not data scientists. You can talk all day long about your nearest neighbors and you know what um, epsilon you used or whatever, but if you can't show somebody something, um, they're less likely to buy into your results, your analysis, your model, and they're, they're actually less likely to even understand what you're saying. So it actually helps with visualizing your data. So let's talk a little bit about the intuition behind PCA. So let's say you just have two variables, right? Um, variable one and two. And you can draw end to end a line that, that maps the, the area of highest variance, right? So you have that line horizontally and you have another line vertically. So all you're doing when you do a principal components analysis is you rank in order of highest to lowest variance and you start compressing and getting rid of the lower variance variables. So this is sort of what it would look like. But you see here, and it's different from our feature extraction where we just dropped the cigarettes per day, right? What we ended up doing is we just moved all of these points down by one, uh, sorry, down to one, one, uh, a, single, a single line without actually losing where it was sitting on the y-axis. We just moved it down. And that's very different from just getting rid of the y-axis and only keeping the measurements that it had on the x. So similarly, in our height in cigarettes per day, we draw that line from, from the lowest point to the highest point to identify the plane of greatest variance. So, and we'll call that principal component one. We have the vertical line to represent principal component two. And now let's go back to our ducks and bunnies, right? All I did from that slide to this slide was to help I got rid of my axes, and I just shifted my data over. So I think uh, magic move didn't really do it properly, and it makes it look like my points moved where they're sitting in space or not. I just actually rotated the whole thing. Again, it's just like the ducks and bunnies example. And then I do the same thing I did in my basic example. 
I just compress it onto the plane with the highest variance. And that's all I'm doing. So on our original axes, oops, sorry. It just looks something like this. So let's say it's some combination of height um, and number of cigarettes smoked. So what's the advantage here? You retain more information, but you can lose interpretability. So the coefficients I was showing you are a little more difficult to explain than your traditional betas that you get from a regression output, right? Because we can explain our betas as for every one unit increase in this, your y goes up by that much, right? It's really, it's easy to grasp, again, for a non-data science audience. If you're pitching it to your boss, if you're explaining it to marketing, you can say this is the impact of. Uh, getting into this, it, it is an impact measurement. Again, you can sort of explain it as signal and noise, and you know, you're parsing out the signal, and, and it has an impact impression. You can't take the numbers as nicely as you could with a linear regression model and say, okay, you know, increase spending by a dollar and get 0.38 something back, you know? So in our two-dimensional, let's say, you know, healthy or not, let's say it was a logit model. Um, in a feature selection one-dimensional model, it's the same thing. You can explain your beta, say, okay, well, it's some function of height. In the feature extraction model, which, uh, sorry, what we're doing here, it's some combination. So it's a logit and there's a beta, and then there are your components here. So it's the betas of a combination of your variables. So I showed you two dimensions to one dimension. Here's what a three dimension to a two dimension would look like instead of being a line, it would be a plane. So you know, once you go down one more dimension, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to visualize, but you imagine as a plane sitting in space at whatever angle is ideal. And each of your principal components will have some combination of your variables, so in this case, height, cigarettes, and exercise, and have a different uh, A, B, and C combination that creates that component. So just the basics about the math behind PCA. So it's singular value decomposition. Um, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a covariance or correlation matrix, they're the core of the PCA. So the eigenvectors, uh, they just determine which direction um, it, your vector goes in the feature space, and the eigenvalues are just their magnitude. So it's the eigenvalues are the variance of the data along the new axes. Questions come up on whether to use a, co a correlation or covariance matrix, and I go a little bit into it in uh, my Python code. Um, so to use a correlation matrix, um, if your variables are measured by different scales and you want to standardize them, um, but you can use the you can use covariance or correlation almost interchangeably. What you can do is just run both and you know see if they equal each other. That's usually the best way to do it. There's all, all these ways to test out which one works the best for you. And here's one key component I think that gets glossed over. So a lot of people new to PCA will approach it by saying, I want to project my data onto a two-dimensional space. And they want to force it by giving it some value. Um, and that's not always the best way to do it because you may lose uh, explanatory value and variance, and you actually need to assess how well your PCA is looking once you've compressed it down. You're not, you're, you know, you are still losing, uh, you know, certain types of, um, certain, uh, a bit of explanatory value. So the Kaiser method is usually to retain any components with eigenvector values greater than one. A scree test is the most common. Scree test is just a bar plot. It'll show you each principal component and how much variance is explained by it. You can also just do cumulative variance explained and then decide that um, you, know, you want a certain percentage of variance. So in a scree plot, ideally, you'll see this elbow. Um, it'll, you know, you'll have n number of components that are giving you the greatest variance explained, and then it'll sort of drop off. Usually you don't, like I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data science models in which they'll say, you know, if you ever model like inertia, for example, they'll say to pick your K, so you should see an elbow. Like I don't think I've ever actually seen an elbow, like outside of a toy model that was built just so I could see the elbow. It's, you, it's, you're always just gonna get this, you know, decreasing line and, uh, so I like the percent variance explained. It's a really good measure, you can understand how much, how much, how well your model is explaining your data. 
Um, so then you can say, you know, I want to explain 75%, just pick all the, the components combined um, that will build to your 70%. So what's the intuition behind PCA? We're attempting to resolve the curse of dimensionality, how? By shifting our perspective and by keeping the eigenvectors that explain the highest amount of variance, and we select those components based on our end goal or by particular methods, Kaiser screen variance. So let's say you really wanted to visualize your data and your goal was visualization of clusters, something like that. Um, then you want a two-dimensional plane. Well, that's your goal. Um, better way or different ways if you want your model to, to be actually explaining what's happening, you want to go with Kaiser screen or percent variance explained. All right, so with that, I'm going to get into my notebook. So I was playing, I was at the Caravel thing and playing around with it earlier. It Super fun. Let me clear all my outputs. Um, drag you over. All right, so if you're unfamiliar with the, um, actually, let me mirror my screen. Oops, that's not what I was looking for. There you go. So um, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, some of these publicly available data sets, the UCI Machine Learning Repository is an excellent tool for picking up toy data sets beyond what's in scikit-learn. Really get bored of the iris data set after some time, or if you're in R, the cars data set, you'll get quite bored of both of them after a while. Um, and you know they don't like. I actually don't know what a sepal is. I've classified based on them like a million times, but could not tell you what a sepal is. Uh, but the UCI machine learning repository is a really great place to find excellent data sets to try all these different kinds of models. Um, and they actually will do the very kind task of classifying it for you into types of tasks that are performed well by each of the data sets. So the uh, wine data just has um, different chemical assessments of different kinds of wines. Um, and it's great for doing classification and clustering and, com and uh, you know, some sort of a components analysis. So this is what our data looks like. We actually have the class label. Um, so PCA, by the way, is considered an unsupervised model. You actually drop your class labels um, you know, versus an LDA, which, which would keep them. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is I split my data into a 70-30 test train set and just pull that out of scikit-learn. Um, and remember I talked about uh, standardizing and it's important for your scatter matrices. Scikit-learn, again, wonderful. You just have something called standard scalar. You feed it your data and it will, it will scale your data. So what I'm doing here is um, decomposing into a covariance scatter matrix and I'm just gonna provide my different eigenvalues and eigenvectors out of that. So let's say we were going with the, uh, with the Kaiser method, um, which was any, any value greater than one. So in that case, we would keep our first four principal components. And this is just our vectors that, that comprise our, our values. So let's say we were looking at our scree plot. So what's interesting is depending on the type of assessment you're picking or the way of choosing your components, you're going to get different results. So our scree plot, like I said, it doesn't really have a really clean elbow. Like I was, I was talking about that earlier. Um, and the first component seems to actually explain a good amount of variance. Just be careful here because this isn't out of 100. This looks like it's explaining 95% of my variance, but it's not. I didn't set my, uh, my y-axis. So it's explaining about 38%. And then, you know, principal component two actually drops pretty low. Um, so, you know, one to two components, maybe even one component can do most of the explaining. And again, depending on how you're doing your selection method, right? So if, if I'm just concerned in, in saying, I want to pick the variables that have the most impact period, I would probably go with one and two or maybe just one. However, if I'm concerned with the cumulative variance, that's over here, 
one and two combined isn't really telling me that much. It's explaining about 55% of my variance. I'm also seeing you know, diminishing returns here by going too high. So I, you know, depending on what I wanted, I might set a threshold at about 80%, in which case I want about five components or four components. So here we're explaining about 75% of variance if we keep the first four components. Um, so if we were, let's say, to follow the Kaiser method, we would have kept the first four, and the first four would explain about 75, which I would have probably done all three, uh, seen what my results were, and w I would have gone with four. Um, whereas, interestingly, in a lot of examples, you might, you might end up going with two. So let's say your goal was to visualize your data on a two-dimensional plane. Well, you probably are then are just going to pick two components, right? Because that's, you're still going to explain a good amount of variance you can put on a two-dimensional plane. The problem with picking four components is I can't really plot that, right? It's, it's kind of hard. So let's, let's plot our, our components in two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. So this is what it would look like if I just went with two dimensions. It's actually not bad, right? I have pretty decent groups. They're nicely divided. So I'm, I'm getting a good distribution and, and pretty decent clustering just based on two components alone. So on three dimensions, um, I'm actually not seeing a ton more information. And, act, and what I'm thinking is that it's this outlier here that was um, driving a lot of my, my third component explained variance. Um, so looking at this, I might even make the choice to go back to two. So, you know, it's, it's um, principal components isn't as uh, cut and dry as it seems. So like I was saying, often people will come in to the coding and say something like, I want to boil this down to two dimensions or three dimensions. And, that might be what you're looking for. It might not be what you're looking for. It depends on your end goal. But just make sure you assess your model, that you have a good understanding of what it is you're trying to do and your end goal before you pick your components. Uh, and you have a ton of tools available at your disposal um, to help you select it. So it's, you know, it's quite simple to do this in scikit-learn. Like I said, it's something like um, you know, n components equals whatever. You can get your, your eigenvalues. Um, you can get your matrices and everything pretty quickly. But what I wanted to do is make sure that you understood what was happening under the hood in principal components, as well as give you some code to play around with. So with that, you know, I have a pretty short talk. Didn't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, Q&A, um, if anybody has any questions. Please come up to the mic to ask your questions. Am I that good of a teacher? All right. <laughs> Metis pays me to do a good job. <laughs> hey. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, so, did you, in, in this step, do the PCA on the train, and then you store sort of what the PCA eigenvectors gave you? And then you apply that later to your Yeah, test. you can actually, I didn't end up doing it here because I just wanted a visual. Uh, I, sorry, so yeah, I did end up doing it here. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what it is. I can train it on the train, then I can test it on it to validate it. But here I just went through the steps of the visualization. I can then validate how well it, it performed on my test data. Okay. But in, in your pipeline, you would kind of keep that in your... Um, yep. Hi, I was just curious, uh, what do you do when you can't load all of your data into memory? Um, you could, you could do a bunch of things. Um, you could take a sample, uh, that would usually help. You're usually able to take a big enough sample so that you can run your PCA. Um, you could also do it on the cloud, that would help as well. Um, so you have a couple of options. I'm not sure if I caught it. What's the theory behind uh, drawing the line at 1.0 for saying I'm going to take these eigenvalues and not these other eigenvalues? I think it just has to do with, it's just one of those rules of thumb that popped up over time to say this is going to point out impactful and not impactful. I don't, I don't think it's like a hard and fast rule. I, I am not familiar enough with it, but I've always been told it's just a rule of thumb. Are there any particular types of data sets where using PCA leads to misleading results, or are there any kind of particular assumptions that are easy to accidentally violate? And get? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of your data will already be labeled, so I would say use LDA if your you know, data is already labeled. 
Um, PCA is helpful. I mean, usually PCA ends up being an intermediate step to then doing your clustering or whatever. So what you'll probably, you'll probably not catch it at this phase, but then when you do your clustering, they'll just either look wonky or different clustering algorithms will give you totally different answers, in which case you probably, you know, PCA probably wasn't the appropriate thing to do. Um, what other uh, dimensionality reduction techniques might you use instead of PCA, sort of filling that same niche in your workflow if you're trying to reduce the dimensions of a data set? I know I've heard of like independent compo component analysis as something that's similar but different. Um, what would you do? Yeah, um, like I already talked about LDA, there's, so everything really just boils down to your matrix decomposition. Um, if you're interested in learning about all these different other kinds of models, what I would do is delve more into the linear algebra aspect of it, so learn more about your singular value decomposition, and every, all of the dimensionality reaction pretty much branches off of that. So that would, that would, that would be the best place to start. All right, well, if you have no other questions, uh, I'll be up here. Thank you.